The sediment tells the tale. Over the ensuing thousand years or so, the human population grows. You know, at first we were talking about a relatively small number of people who came in outrigger canoes. It couldn't have been that many. But over time, the population on this island in prehistoric times built up to probably something like the population of the island today. There were a lot of people here. People have a big job transforming the landscape, cutting down trees, burning off the grasslands and the brushlands. And as a result of these impacts, then smaller creatures begin to go extinct. At the time that Captain Cook arrived, the wave of biological invasions really crest. Suddenly there are all these goat bones and goat teeth in that layer. Suddenly there's a lot fewer birds and trees around. The Polynesians brought only a small number of species with them. Europeans have brought hundreds and hundreds of species. Uh, we're now to the point where uh, there are about a thousand native species of plants in the Hawaiian Islands and over a thousand naturalized invasive species, things that have been introduced by people. The evolution has now entered a new mode. Something new altogether is happening and it has to do with what humans do to the evolutionary process. The invasion of Hawaii is a microcosm of what's happening throughout the world today. At any moment, 100,000 people are suspended in planes over the Atlantic Ocean, traveling from one continent to another. Cargo is sent to the furthest corners of the earth in a matter of days or even hours. And with it comes other, smaller passengers who are not going to get back on the plane and go home. In ships, ballast water is taken up in one port and discharged in another. With it comes invasive species like the zebra mussel, which arrived in the United States in 1988. Quick to reproduce, these two inch long mollusks encrust spawning grounds, clog water pipes, and consume plankton, which native fish and mussels need to survive. In the past decade, the U.S. government has spent four billion dollars trying to control them. Many animals and plants that find their way in can easily adapt to new environments and flourish. Some of them don't cause problems, but there are others we'd rather we're not so good at sneaking in. In our new interconnected world, the invasive species we carry with us are dramatically increasing the rate of extinction of native life. Some of these animals were brought in by private individuals as pets. Some were brought in either for resale as far as food products. And some of these actually stowed away on some of our aircrafts and ships that arrived here in Hawaii. The brown tree snake is one of them. Originally from New Guinea, it can grow up to 11 feet long. During World War II, the snakes began to climb the landing gear of planes and curl up in the wheel housings, or hitchhike rides on cargo ships. When they arrived in Guam, the snakes would slither off and head for the jungle. Then they would climb trees in search of food. The eggs of the native birds were easy targets and nine of Guam's 11 forest bird species were driven to extinction. Hawaii's Department of Agriculture now has to use trained beagles to sniff out the snakes. Where is it? No. This time it's a test for training, but the next time it will be for real. Good girl, good girl. The last brown tree snake that showed up here was found in the wheel well of a continent of Micronesia 747 aircraft that arrived the day before from Guam. It does show that the snakes are getting up there. The main word for the Hawaii Department of Agriculture is that the brown tree snake becomes established in Hawaii. Hawaii leads the nation in the amount of endangered species. Okay? Many of those species are birds. 
Okay. If Hawaii loses on native birds, we also lose a lot of our native plants, and the whole ecosystem in Hawaii will be affected forever. And the paradise we know might not be around in years to come. My suspicion is that of all the things that we've done to the planet so far, whether it's climate change, things we've done to the atmosphere, things we've done to the water, pollution problems, all of those are bad things. But I think, as it stands right now at least, that the thing we've done, which will be most visible in the fossil record in a million years, is going to be these biological invasions. Scientists have a term for biological invaders. They call them weed species. Like weeds, they survive and adapt almost anywhere and push out the native competition. They are the ultimate survivors. There's quite a bit of speculation and theorizing about why invaders seem to be so successful in moving into a new area. The animals that tend to invade are more mobile, maybe more adaptive to more general changes in habitats, more flexible with environmental change. That confers some kind of competitive advantage. Of all the weed species on Earth, we are the most mobile, the most adaptable, and the most flexible by far. The good news is, we'll probably be around for a long time. The bad news is, the world around us may be very different. As the rate of extinction accelerates, every species that disappears leaves one less to prop up others. So the question is, in our own modern world, with our own house of cards, how close are we to that whole edifice coming down? Have we reached that threshold? This is the Great Plains state of North Dakota, farm country. It's where one of the battles against human-caused extinction is being fought, only this time by pitting two biological invaders against each other. The enemy here is a weed called leafy spurge. So well adapted and tenacious, it threatens to kill off native grasses. It's already spread across a million acres. A century ago, pioneers accidentally brought it with them in bags of seed. Now the settler's descendants are faced with the consequences. The leafy spurge limits the number of cattle that I can put in a pasture. I mean, they'll eat the grass that's in there, but if it's infested with leafy spurge, they just won't touch it. There's a milky substance to it, and it's pretty bitter. They don't like it. Cy Kittleson's great-grandfather homesteaded the land. Today, Cy and his father own 4,000 acres. The weed covers over a third of their ranch. They have tried spraying it with a weed killer, but leafy spurge is not easily beaten. I look at it as cancer to the land and uh, it makes the land just totally useless the chemicals cost between 90 and 100 dollars a gallon and um, it takes about a gallon to cover one acre of land and so that's a hundred dollars an acre and that's not counting your time and that's about all the land is worth 